Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Thomas, and I'm a librarian at the University of Rajana and a member of the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Uh, we will be having a uh, presentation today on the use and abuse of university discipline with uh, Mark Mercer and uh, Francis Wooderson. And I will let Francis in a moment introduce uh, um, the two, uh, herself and, and Mark, and the sort of the, what the discussion today will entail. Um, but I just wanted to do a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, we will be recording the session, as you probably have noticed. Um, we will uh, have questions after the presentation. And uh, if you want to participate in the, the discussion afterwards, uh, you're welcome to send uh, everyone or, or just me, um, whatever you prefer, um, a message in the chat in Zoom. And I will go through, uh, we'll try to reach all the questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will, uh, I will call on uh, people sequentially uh, to, to ask their question and uh, we can have, have discussion uh, with the two presenters. Um, I would like to request that everyone, unless you are talking at the moment, uh, to mute yourself um, in uh, with your microphone. I, it, it's up to you about if you wanted to um, shut off your camera or not. Uh, it, it can be advisable just uh, for bandwidth so that you have a better uh, reception of the talk. Um, but you do not have to do that, but you do have to mute. And uh, if people forget to mute, I will mute you uh, without prejudice. Um, before for uh, the presentation, so we don't have feedback. Uh, I will turn it over to Francis. Thank you very much, Robert. My name is Francis Whittleson. I'm a board member uh, for the Society for, for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. I've been a board member for a number of years. I'm also a professor in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'll just, uh, tell you, uh, both Mark and I are um, have been engaged in disciplinary processes ourselves, so we are um, well acquainted with what happens, so we'll have some expertise with respect to this. Um, Mark as well has been writing uh, extensively on this, and, and Mark is, a, for people who don't know Mark, he is the president of the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. He uh, uh, earned his doctorate in 1991, and uh, he write, he's at St. Mary's, he's a philosophy professor at St. Mary's, and writes extensively on matters pertaining to academic freedom, freedom of expression, but, uh, and heard as president, obviously, many cases of people being disciplined, but only recently uh, drew the ire of the authorities uh, uh, and then was subjected to a, a, a star chamber process. Um, in terms of his philosophical work, he works in the philosophy of mind and also examines ethics and epistemology. Um, Mark, uh, and I am quite well acquainted with Mark's uh, case, and he as well has a website uh, where he has outlined all the things that happened to him. And for people who are in, interested in discipline uh, and how professors are disciplined, they might want to take a look at that. Uh, but um, in one of his pieces that I was reading, uh, he said that according to the SM, the, the, the president of St. Mary's, uh, he was found to have neglected his obligations to contribute to a respectful environment for work and study and to help create an environment that is free from harassment and discrimination. And he also violated his responsibility to respect the rights of others in the university community and to nurture a climate of respect. So that's what Mark was, uh, was found to have done and was subjected to four months of, of processes and I uh, personally have, uh, although I avoided disciplinary action for many years, surprisingly, um, the increasing totalitarianism on campus has resulted in me being subjected to a whole litany of disciplinary processes starting in November 2020, uh, and it will go on for a number of years. It's a huge, complex case. I unfortunately am under a gag order by Mount Royal University uh, and can't really discuss the specifics, 
but um, I have gone through and, and am currently going through investigations uh, uh, that are where you have a law firm that's hired and all sorts of things have occurred. Um, I was disciplined uh, a few months ago uh, and all of this is being fought uh, through the faculty association and we'll be going to arbitration in a year or two uh, and so on. But anyway, I, so I am very uh, acquainted with all these kinds of things that are happening. And also Mark and I have seen many cases of terrible things happening to professors, for things that are, you would you think that there must be something more to it than what is going on. So the plan for today then is because Mark has written a number of very interesting pieces that are all available on his website about discipline. Uh, and Mark claims that discipline, we can't avoid it. Like there, there, there is going to be cases where discipline occurs, but there are um, uses of discipline and there are abuses of discipline. So what we wanted to do is have a bit of a discussion to kind of tease out um, you know, what, what these different parameters are. So I guess we should start, Mark, by you explaining, if you could just explain what you see as being a disciplinary process, like what actually are we talking about when we talk about discipline? Okay, uh, I'll, first of all, I just want to uh, uh, correct the record. Uh, I was alleged to have treated someone uh, disrespectfully. Okay. Um, a complainant, and I don't know who the complainant is, uh, but the, um, uh, the procedures, uh, the proceedings were dropped. And so I was not found. Uh, the allegations weren't weren't ever tested, uh, and uh, in, indeed were never uh, never uh, never came to uh, uh, to me being uh, uh, being disciplined. Uh, so yes, uh, while it was alleged that I had treated someone uh, disrespectfully, uh, someone whom I don't know, I don't know who it was. Um, the um, uh, the proceedings were just dropped after the uh, initial meeting. Um, Yes. Uh, now, I don't think I've learned a single thing that I didn't know uh, from my own case. Um, a single thing that I didn't know from the uh, uh, from the cases that I've I've uh, uh, witnessed and uh, people have uh, people have told me about, um, and uh, uh, cases where I've uh, I, I've been sent some uh, some documents. Uh, so uh, my own uh, uh, my own uh, brief and um, uh, really compared to so many others ones I've heard about untroubling run in with university discipline um, uh, didn't uh, didn't lead me to think about uh, uh, discipline at universities. I've been thinking about it for uh, for a while. Uh, maybe my own run in made it a bit urgent, <laughs> more urgent for me to think about it. Um, now, what we're talking about then uh, are those cases where something like a, where a penalty uh, can be imposed by an administration on a professor. Uh, we could also talk about disciplining uh, students uh, as well, but I'm, uh, um, uh, it's the uh, discipline applied to uh, professors that I'm interested in mainly here. Uh, a disciplinary procedure is begun when a, um, uh, a member of the um, upper uh, uh, administration receives a complaint, though some universities, the um, president vice or vice president, the university itself can initiate a disciplinary procedure. Uh, usually, uh, they are initiated when um, the uh, university receives a complaint. Now, uh, and again, uh, uh, complaints that uh, uh, if um, uh, if discipline is imposed, discipline being uh, being punishment, um, a letter of reprimand, suspension without pay, suspension with pay, uh, or uh, finally termination. Uh, this is what we're talking about. And I want to distinguish it from. Um, Quality review on the one side, right, where a professor is um, uh, alleged, alleged uh, where a professor is thought by some to uh, his performance to uh, have fallen below standard, and uh, the university, a provo or vice president academic, thinks that it's worth investigating. Uh, that's not um, um, a case of discipline, at least not um, as I'm talking about, not that it can't be abused. Uh, um, quality uh, assurance, quality review can be abused. So we have that setting that on the one side and setting on the other side, uh, conflict resolution. And many universities have conflict resolution officers or conflict revolution, um, uh, resolution advisors. Uh, but these are um, uh, sub-discipline or non-disciplinary. Uh, they are um, 
uh, voluntary um, what comes to our recommendations and one doesn't have to uh, live by the recommendations. So when talking about uh, university discipline against professors, we're talking about those, um, uh, those procedures whereby the university calls a professor on the carpet, the professor has to come and the possibility of a letter of reprimand in the file, um, suspension with, uh, with pay, suspension without pay or, dis or um, dismissal is present. Um, and um, I'm going to be talking, as Francis and I will be uh, talking today mainly you know, abstractly or um, conceptually or theoretically. But I do want to uh, uh, echo uh, Francis's point that um, many people, uh, many people I know, professors have, uh, uh, have suffered uh, through disciplinary uh, procedures, um, uh, wrong-headed ones uh, uh, and the like. So, I mean, there, is, there are um, um, costs and, and, and pain involved in this, even though uh, today we'll be, uh, we'll be talking, I think, at a more abstract or, or uh, 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 theoretical level. Uh, in addition to the, uh, to the papers um, that uh, are on my website and papers that I've, uh, that, that I've published, which are usually uh, just journal articles, uh, not papers, I'm working on a quasi-academic uh, paper uh, right now. Uh, some members of the audience have uh, have, have copies, have a copy of it. Uh, and so uh, one of my interests tonight is to uh, get some criticism and uh, uh, maybe um, useful comments uh, so that uh, when, I, when I send the thing off, I'll, uh, I'll have a you know, better chance of uh, communicating with, uh, with, with my audience. Uh, but anyway, yes, that's, uh, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, disciplinary procedures at a university. Okay, so, um, okay, so there has to be some kind of penalty that's going to be imposed uh, for it to be disciplined. And it has to be matters that are um, not concerning the quality of your academic work. And uh, it's not some kind of mediation process where there's, it's just a voluntary type of process. So disciplinary processes are, are generally mandatory. Um, and you do like, this is what I, I like I was told I had to uh, participate, even though I was protesting the, uh, that the procedures weren't in place, natural justice wasn't being uh, yeah. abided by, um, but I was just told, no, you must do this and uh, you can protest and that will happen along the same track. So you, you're not going to be able to stop the proceedings. They're just going to continue. Um, but in terms of the, the you, you said that the title of the, the talk is the, the use and abuse of mm -hmm. discipline. So when does this kind of uh, penalty, this imposition of penalty um, for, I think the two things that you have specified are harassment and sort of what you call scheduling, which is, you know, that you're supposed to show up for and teach and you're supposed to, you're supposed to follow certain rules. When does the discipline become uh, abusive? How would you, would you see it as being abusive? Well, yeah, that's right. I, I draw a rough and ready uh, distinction between what I call scheduling and uh, harassment, and uh, I'm happy to uh, find other terms for this distinction. I don't think that it's always easy to categorize one or the other. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, disciplinary procedures uh, following complaints um, are, are launched when professors do things at, such as uh, fail to show up for their classes, fail to show up for their classes on time. Um, don't uh, hand out the, um, the grading scheme um, uh, uh, when they should. Uh, so this, these are the things I put on the side of scheduling. Um, other things that uh, I don't know if the word scheduling works for them, but it's, it, it's in that, uh, I put them on that side, um, exceeding the number of hours of paid outside work that, you, uh, that your, your, your contract uh, allows. Um, um, uh, th that sort of thing. On the, um, on the harassment side, right, it's uh, things such as uh, failing to um, uh, uh, cultivate a climate of respect, um, actual harassment, um, and other um, uh, behaviors, bullying, uh, and, uh, and the like uh, that are alleged. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the complaint uh, received um, by the academic vice president, the academic vice president decides that it merits, uh, 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 warrants proceeding, um, the uh, president is on side. Uh, because the uh, professor has violated 
some university regulation uh, having to do with either behavior towards other people, uh, call it harassment generally, or uh, failing to live up to uh, contractual um, obligations, um, not um, abusing the, uh, the postal uh, uh, prerogatives one has, uh, uh, things like that. Now, um, I, I've, uh, I've discovered maybe in just the past 10 or 20 years, and it's been a shock to me, and, I'm, uh, and maybe someone will be able to argue it uh, out of me, but it was a shock to me to discover that I am a retributionist. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I think punishment for the sake of punishment is entirely appropriate. Um, and um, uh, I remember as a student hearing this from one of my professors and I was appalled, uh, but um, I've, I've come around to that view. But at the same time, I think that uh, punishment for the sake of punishment, that is um, punishment in order to um, balance the books, uh, you know, so, so that the, the, the miscreant pays the price. I think it's a very, very narrow range of offenses that should draw um, uh, uh, the um, uh, retributivist um, impulse. Murder, rape, and robbery, I think, are the... <laughs> Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the main ones that fall in that category. And I think also that, only, that, that um, given a culture, uh, a society, a political system such as ours, justice can be, um, sorry, uh, retribution can be handed out only by um, uh, properly convened courts, uh, by, a, uh, by, a, by a justice system. I think one misuse of university discipline is to apply is, is, is for administrators or for the university to apply the penalties in the spirit of retribution. That is in the spirit of making the bastard pay, um, in the spirit of balancing the books, um, um, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, again, uh, it's not a, this is not a, um, uh, an anti-retributivist uh, speaking about this. I've, uh, uh, maybe two decades now, I, I think that uh, there's uh, that, that uh, the bastard should pay, uh, but that is the, the bastards who murder, rape, and rot and and uh, and, and thieve. Um, but it does seem to me, uh, from the cases that uh, I, I'm, uh, I, from many of the cases that I'm familiar with, and again, it's uh, you know, uh, not a um, a random sample, uh, so I, you know, I don't know how extensive it is. Uh, that administrators are looking uh, to, um, to punish for the sake of punishment in some cases. So I think that's a, uh, I think that's an abuse uh, mm -hmm. that a, um, um, uh, a, a university um, calling a, a professor on the carpet um, for the sake of, um, uh, of imposing pain as a way of balancing the books for the, uh, the, the pain that others, uh, that that uh, person is alleged to have caused uh, is I think, uh, uh, one abuse of, um, uh, of, uh, of disciplinary university. Now, again, um, like much of my uh, philosophical work, what I, what I try to do when I'm thinking about universities is um, to ask what certain values require of us and how certain values fit and don't fit together. So I begin from um, an idea that I call uh, liberal study. And I take liberal study to involve uh, people who value their moral and intellectual autonomy coming together to try to understand some aspects of the world. Now, not all um, university disciplines are in the game of understanding aspects of the world. There's also interpretation and evaluation. Uh, but um, just uh, for the sake of this discussion, just to, uh, let it go proxy that what we're trying to do is understand uh, the things in the world. And uh, for us, uh, because we value intellectual and moral, uh, our intellectual and moral autonomy, what, what really matters to us is the process by which we come to construct our understanding. That is, we would rather misunderstand something uh, for good reasons of evidence and argument, uh, reasons that we judge to be good for uh, uh, evidence and argument, than understand something on the basis of, uh, as a result of social or psychological pressures. And our commitment then, is to leave others free to make up their own mind. That is to uh, avoid as far as possible, and we're humans and we're, it's difficult for, to, uh, for us to avoid, us, uh, avoid this. That's why universities are very rare and strange, uh, strange institutions. Um, 
to, to leave others to uh, make up their minds for their own selves. That is uh, not to impose um, uh, uh, beliefs or values, uh, not to try to get them to believe or value what we want them to believe or value by applying pressures, uh, by applying pressures to them. Uh, so then we want to ask, well, if there's a if there's an institution that's dedicated to housing this thing that I call liberal study, what sort of institutional arrangements uh, will be present? Uh, what would it look like? Um, but again, we have to think, well, it's going to be in the real world, in this world. Um, and so uh, perhaps we'll have to make compromises here or there in order for um, uh, uh, funding and support and all the other things institutions need in order to keep going uh, in, in the world. Uh, so if we find ourselves compromising something uh, that gets in the way of our exercise of moral intellectual autonomy and trying to figure out uh, uh, the ways of the world, it had better be because it's necessary in order to keep the institution going, right? And so I think that procedures of discipline are necessary given uh, uh, humans and, uh, and our world, uh, but uh, they should be um, a very last resort, uh, something that we should uh, uh, come to only, um, uh, only when other things have failed uh, in order to preserve the, um, uh, the ethos and the values and the goals of what I'm calling liberal study. So if I understand you then, Mark, um, basically your argument is, is that any discipline, or, or maybe this is a bit too extreme, but any discipline that threatens the, the university as a place for liberal, liberal study, that anything that has that effect of impinging upon that, of constraining it, that's when we're sort of seeing discipline being abused. Is that, is that generally what you're arguing? I, I wouldn't disagree with that, but, uh, but you said um, effects. And, and so I, it's, it's more, it, 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 all, all I need is inconsistency. Right. If uh, the um, if the disciplinary route, taking the disciplinary route, is inconsistent with university values of um, um, uh, intellectual and moral uh, uh, intellectual and moral autonomy, uh, then um, that uh, th that procedure may very well be an abuse of, uh, of of the disciplinary procedures at the university. Yes. Now, the, the, the justification for it, on the other hand, is, well, you know, we have to do something. The situation is, is so bad that other aspects of our uh, institution would, uh, uh, would be put at risk unless we, uh, unless we engaged in, uh, in discipline. Yes, because a couple of other factors that you mention in, in your articles is um, placating, sort of placation, uh, mm -hmm. This is one of the, and you can really notice this in many of the, 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 the stuff about harassment when it comes into the harassment uh, kind of field. Um, so pl placating a, a, someone who's unhappy uh, and, and especially someone who's a, uh, a group that, a member of a group that people are very concerned about. Uh, and this is to some extent, my case is, is hinging upon this because um, there's, uh, an attempt to bring in more Indigenous scholars to Mount Royal, and it's felt that, you know, my arguments are upsetting to some members of, of, of the Indigenous community, and therefore to make those scholars feel like they're being listened to and so on, um, there should be some kind of discipline that is uh, brought against me. So that's one thing that you mentioned. Uh, and the other is, um, a goal of social justice, some kind of social justice goal. So we need to have discipline uh, in order to facilitate that because you have people making arguments which are perceived to be uh, against that. And discipline is a, is a way of trying to control um, ideas that are put forward that are seen as, as having a negative impact on the, the, that goal. So those are, um, is the reason why you're opposed to using discipline for those purposes? Is that because it has such a negative impact on the university as a place for liberal study? Even if it doesn't have a, a bad impact, it's still inconsistent with uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the academic mission and, uh, and, and academic values. But I'll just, uh, let, let me take a look at my, um, my notes just to make sure I've got everything. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, first thing, um, when is discipline not abused? When is it properly used? Okay, um, it's, uh, I, I think it, um, uh, it, calling a professor on the carpet is warranted so long as uh, that professor has, well, the allegation at least is that professor has violated a university regulation. Now let's take it that that university regulation is a good regulation and was properly um, instituted just uh, you know, for, for the sake of argument. Now, uh, of course, not all of them are, and many professors are, are called on the carpet for violating uh, something that is indeed a regulation, but it really shouldn't be uh, at, a, at an institution of, uh, of liberal study. But um, uh, 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 proper use of, uh, of discipline comes only after other attempts and formal attempts have been made to get the professor to stop doing whatever it is that this professor um, has been doing that is causing uh, uh, problems with the research and teaching uh, function of the university uh, or is costing the university money in um, uh, 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 abusing the, uh, the, the postal service or whatever as a, as a minor example. So yes, um, I, I, I think um, uh, it is uh, entirely proper for a university to have a set of procedures to handle cases uh, where university regulations are, uh, where a professor has violated re university regulations and uh, talking to the professor about this has not worked. But then those penalties, I think, um, can be imposed, um, you know, uh, letter of reprimand, uh, suspension with pay, suspension without pay, ultimately um, uh, uh, termination, if, if, if that's the, uh, the only way to uh, uh, halt the thing. And, um, you know, uh, the, the consequences of not terminating are, are worse than, uh, than doing so. Um, that these, um, uh, th that the penalties must be applied in the spirit only of getting the fellow to stop. Not in the spirit of retribution, not in um, uh, 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 the, the spirit of punishment, uh, just in the spirit of, um, of, of penalties. In, in much the same way that um, many of the things we do are hedged by penalties for uh, violating one rule or not. And, and, and why do we do this? Well, we do it to keep things on track. Uh, for an example, um, many of us have late policies whereby we penalize students by subtracting a, a, a grade or two uh, from, a, uh, from uh, the, uh, the score uh, of the essay. Uh, this isn't a punishment, right? This is merely a device to keep things moving. Mm. Um, I think maybe speeding tickets might be an example as well. They're not intended as punishment. They're intended to... Uh, um, um, uh, get people to uh, conform their behavior uh, to the uh, 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 to what is appropriate um, uh, for the uh, for the highway system or for the uh, uh, for the streets. Um, likewise, uh, when uh, students are penalized or professors even are penalized for um, uh, plagiarism, that's not meant as a punishment, right? Um, the student. Uh, uh, has not completed the work in the way that was required and so doesn't get credit for it, right? That's not to, to, to punish the student. Um, so uh, penalties can be very severe and yet not be imposed on in, in the spirit of retribution, the spirit of punishment. Uh, so when I'm talking about um, uh, 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 a system of university discipline that uh, potentially imposes penalties, I'm thinking that this is a system that comes into play only if um, bad behavior, rule, uh, rule violation, regulation viol violation can't be uh, stopped otherwise. Uh, and uh, the penalties are imposed just in the spirit of getting the, uh, the behavior to, uh, to stop. Now, I think though uh, that um, university discipline is used by administrators in many other uh, ways. Now, you mentioned um, duplicate or mollify a complaint. Uh, I think that happens all the time, and I think that that is entirely um, anti-collegial and um, uh, uh, inconsistent uh, with, uh, with university values, at least a university of, of, of liberal study. Uh, duplicate or mollify a complaint. Um, certainly that, I, I, well, certainly. I believe that was what was 
up in my uh, in, in in my case. Uh, I, I think that was you know entirely. The university was showing a powerful and important person at the university that it took the complaint seriously, right? And 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 this is the way to do it. But again, that is to um, um, that is to treat someone disrespectfully, is to use them as a means to one's end without involving uh, their, uh, with, without their consent in, in, in being a means. Uh, if we are respecting the moral intellectual autonomy uh, of each of us, we don't manipulate uh, each other, uh, right? And so this, is a, this constitutes a violation of what I take to be a, a sound academic value, at least at an institution of, um, uh, of liberal studies. Um, to affirm or restore a complainant's dignity or status or prerogatives. Again, that's uh, uh, to discipline someone in order to set someone back in, uh, uh, in their dignity uh, is to uh, abuse the system, to use the uh, professor as a means to some end that that professor hasn't consented to be used uh, to. I mean, I think also, you know, in, in my own case, if they'd come, the very first thing I hear is that, you know, here's a letter uh, summoning me to a disciplinary meeting. Um, well, why didn't someone call me and say that someone was upset by something I said? And I can, you know, uh, but, uh, it, and, and clearly it was that this was to signal the university's commitment. Uh, if they, you know, uh, called me up, then it's, you know, just uh, collegial. Uh, but that doesn't have the effect that uh, sending a, a letter summoning a professor to a disciplinary meeting, uh, meeting has. Um, yes, Mark, just to uh, elaborate upon your point there too, is I believe they they did want you to send your whatever you were forced to do to a whole bunch oh, of people got... as well. Like you didn't have to do that at the end, but they were hoping you were going to do that. So that's like, again, signaling to a whole bunch of people that you are kind of yeah. have some kind of contrition that you have been, uh, you're displaying and, and that they've done their work. The, the administrators have done their work. Well, that's right. I think another abuse of, uh, of disparate procedures is, uh, and, and even when there was no penalty, right? I was not, I was not penalized mm -hmm. uh, in, in, any, in any way, um, is to show who's boss. Mm. Right. And, and well, that's anti-collegial, right? We aren't, there are no bosses. We're, we're, we're a group <laughs> of intellectuals. Uh, uh, yes, there are bosses, and they, you know they, there need to be bosses uh, for the running of the institution. Uh, but ideally, there are no bosses, and the bosses should act as bosses only when that's required in order to keep the project going. Um, signaling a commitment, deterrence—you uh, know th th these are other uh, ways in which, uh, uh, to my mind, discipline is used from the uh, examples that, uh, that that I've seen. But I think is um, inconsistent uh, with uh, academic values. Uh, that's inconsistent with the uh, uh, research and teaching uh, missions of the uh, university. Uh, so uh, the only appropriate recourse to discipline, and this I, I hope is controversial, and some people will <laughs> criticize me, uh, is to bring an end to a violation of a university regulation when continued violation threatens the university's teaching or research functions. Penalties and threats of penalties are there simply to get that behavior to stop. Uh, anything else I believe to be an abuse of uh, disciplinary procedures, an abuse that's, uh, or it's abusive of disciplinary procedures because they are inconsistent uh, with the goals and values of liberal studies. So um, I think we just got a couple of minutes more before we go to the question and answer period, but I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on why you think, like it seems to me that this is becoming more prominent. Of course, we don't have a systematic analysis of this, but it seems to me um, we're hearing about it more and more, certainly at the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship, um, especially the harassment stuff. Like the harassment stuff, I never even heard people saying, you're a harasser, this harassment, this harassment, that. And that just a couple of years ago started to become very prominent. People were saying that. So it was obviously on their radar as a way of using university policies to, um, you know, kind of constrain opinions that were thought to be, quote unquote, disrespectful. 
Um, and I'm wondering, I, I, I myself think it has to do with the increasing corporatization of the university because the university is becoming concerned about its brand. It wants uh, certain goals to be understood that it's, it's gonna be doing this. For example, Mount Royal, we have um, our, our slogan uh, is you belong here. That's not academic excellence, not nothing like that. You belong here. And it doesn't have, like, it doesn't want, I don't belong, it doesn't care if I feel that I belong there. Like, that's not its concern. Its concern is particular groups that it wants to have them feel that they belong. And the harassment stuff seems to be a way that they're able to kind of do something which is making those groups feel that they are being listened to in some way. And I think this is, uh, there's some connection to the corporate kind of mentality, the hierarchy that you mention in your work, that it's not that we don't have any bosses. We have the corporate structure that we are to some extent having to fall in line with. Do you see that as being a factor or do you have other explanations for why this is becoming so prominent? I don't have any explanations. Um, your explanation is a um, hypothesis uh, worth testing. Um, mm. I don't, uh, um, I, 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 my, um, what, 26 or 27 years uh, teaching um, at different universities, I haven't always been paying attention. I didn't start paying attention to <laughs> universities until the early uh, 2000, 2006 or so. Um, but yeah, uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, things are, worse that in the sense that um, university discipline is resorted to more often. But again, uh, they're the, 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 the university considers that a personnel matter, so they don't, uh, uh, they don't speak of it. Um, professors might be embarrassed, uh, so they don't speak of it. Uh, I really would like to see good empirical work um, about uh, 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 university discipline, how many professors are, are, are called at the different universities, uh, what are the uh, allegations, what are, what are the results. Uh, but we, uh, as far as I know, we don't have that. Uh, so well, I, we, we, the confidentiality, we? one of the big problems is, and this is in my case, I would love to talk about like send everyone here all the mm -hmm. stuff that has happened so that they could have a look at what has gone on. Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I've been, you know, given uh, a directive mm -hmm. that if I violate a confidentiality, I can't even talk about, you know, like the process at all, um, mm -hmm. then I could be terminated. Uh, that, that's the language. And no one is really all that sure about how much standing this has but basically the university can fire you for anything of course your union will grieve it like like if you have a good union but they, they don't they they make no bones about uh you know just doing whatever it is that they want to do and it's the unions that are there to hold them accountable but of course that just ensnares you in an unbelievable type of process so i'm not even sure how we would get information on all the disciplinary processes are happening because, you know, most of the people that are going through this have been told that they can't mm -hmm. talk about it. And I'm not even sure what the status of that is after all the, all the arbitration and everything. And very rarely do things go to arbitration. That's the other problem. I insisted to my union that we are going to uh, uh, arbitration uh, and they know that if they don't do that, uh, then they'll get a duty of fair representation complaint uh, that'll be filed. But that's not very successful. And even if they do go to arbitration, they can do it in such a way that it's not very, it's not, a, it's kind of a lackluster kind of defense. So there's all these kinds of fears if you are, you know, wanting to continue in your position. Um, so I, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to get systematic uh, types of data on this subject. Well, you, you might be right, but I think um, uh, researchers, uh, maybe even journalists uh, filing um, freedom of information uh, requests, all they're asking for is, uh, well, what was the allegation? Uh, they don't need to know against whom, uh, they don't need to, uh, and uh, you know, what, was the, what was the outcome? Uh, so I think um, um, uh, uh, information that um, reveals nothing about the um, uh, uh, the um, accused or the uh, the complainants um, uh, uh, could be collected. Um, I don't see why. I think, and I think there's a real lacuna there. I think uh, you know it would be good to have um, 
statistics uh, as uh, you know. Uh, the other thing is I, I was surprised when I started writing about, um, you know, uh, um, theoretically or perhaps philosophically about discipline at a university, how little um, writing there is about discipline at a university in the academic journals, in the, mm. um, uh, in, in the um, uh, uh, journals um, uh, that devoted to uh, universities and, and journals of uh, philosophy of education. Uh, it and then going through uh, the books on my on, on my bookshelf, um, I, I, you know my favorite books. I, I, I find well, there's there's very little about um, uh, uh, disciplining professors in them. Uh, so I, you know I think that's a, the discussion we're having tonight is one that I would like to see in the um, in the academic journals, mm. and, and I'd like also to see in the academic journals and in the, the popular press. Um, uh, information about uh, what's happening, how, you know, how often and to whom. Yes, well, I think part of it is just we're in denial. We like I, I didn't realize that this was, of course, until you're subjected to it yourself. Uh, you have no idea what goes on, and and you have a very naive attitude to begin with that you know it's all going to be very fair and so on. But of course, it, it's going to be highly unlikely that's going to be the case, because it's sort of the power dynamics that have brought about it about in the first place. Um, so I think that's part of it. And, and we sort of have this idea that, you know, universities are this these collegial places like that. That's kind of what we were had the expectation that they would be like. And although they've never uh, like I've been in the university system, I guess, um, since 2005, uh, and things were much better in 2005. Like now, in the last couple of years, it has become a totally different environment. That's a, an amazingly different environment. So I think that might be it. We're just kind of catching up to the, the the serious problem that is there, which if you know our cases are anything to go by, this is a huge monster uh, that has to be grappled with and exposed. And, uh, you know, hopefully with my case, you know, once I do get through all these hoops, which I'm going to follow to the end, I'm going to have a huge uh, um, amount of documents that people can use as a, as a kind of an example of what, what kind of can go on. Um, mine is a bit, I don't know how unusual it is, but I don't think it's that unusual. I think the unusual part is that I, when I started to have these processes being leveled against me, I fought back harder fight back harder that's the and that of course that creates a whole new dynamic but at least you get the, everything on paper everything starts to all the processes start to, to happen whereas most people when they're hit with these kinds of processes their their um their general response is keep your head down don't get into trouble again right mm -hmm. that, that's all, i think that's what happens anyway i think we've mark we've been talking for about 40 minutes or so. Yeah, sorry. Just wanted to, sorry about that, guys. We just wanted to go for half an hour, but now let's turn it <laughs> Anyway, so I think that uh, what we'll do now is we'll let Robert Thomas, who is our Zoom master, uh, take over. And hopefully he is, uh, there's some questions already and either Mark or I or both can try to answer your questions or have a discussion as well. Thank you very much, Francis and Mark. Um, but the first question would come from Boris, uh, if he would like to speak. And after that, we'll go to Rhoda. Boris? Hi, Boris. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, I'm, I'm listening to both of you, and I'm asking myself the question, you know, what is the approach we should be taking with, in dealing with, with the problems? And, and Mark, I think, um, your suggestion that uh, we articulate clearly a liberal studies program as a kind of standard um, against which to measure the abuse or abuse of some of these disciplinary practices uh, by administrators is valid, um, worthwhile pursuing, but I suspect that it's really at best only a partial solution to the problem and that really um, attacking the problem effectively requires looking for answer strategies that go well beyond the university itself. Uh, and as I think Francis comments seem to suggest, looking at the larger social political picture 
in which this problem of the contemporary university finds itself. Um, when we think of these present day university administrators and their willingness to, um, to abuse, as you suggest, these disciplinary practices in ways that ultimately f violate the principles of academic freedom. What is the source of their uh, thinking? Well, surely I think as we've discussed in previous instances, um, it seems to be the sort of growing uh, preeminence of a certain kind of public philosophy. And that is the public philosophy of, uh, of latter-day postmodern progressivism with its emphasis on identity politics. That public philosophy has been increasingly influential it has become increasingly dominant, not only at universities, but also in the media, in uh, educational and cultural uh, um, institutions, up and down the scale. Um, and corporations, <clears throat> Francis, I think you were right to talk about the corporatization of the university as a huge part of the problem. But what they're doing is they're, they're corporatizing it in line with this progressive, uh, agenda of identity politics in a curious sort of way. Um, <clears throat> so as long as these administrators feel that that is the wind behind their sails and that's the win those are the winds that they have to pay attention to, they will go on doing what they're doing regardless of our complaints about abuse of academic freedom, et cetera, et cetera, because they will maybe in most cases even see those as legitimate demands emanating from society as a whole that justify these kinds of limitations. So it seems to me what we have to do at some point is to engage with these problems on a larger, more political level, show these people that they're wrong and, uh, and, and articulate the case for you know, academic freedom and all of that involves in terms of curriculum and disciplinary practices, et cetera, in a way that the larger population of Canada as a whole can begin to understand. They can begin to understand how the path that we are on now is in violation of the fundamental principles of liberal democracy, of which a liberal university is an essential part. Um, and, 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 um, and, and they have to begin to see that everything that's happening in these areas uh, amounts to an erosion of that very liberal political culture that is including freedom of speech, freedom of thought, uh, cultivation of a friendliness towards reasonableness and so on. Um, you know, that what's happening now flies in the face of all of that. That's what the people have to be made to understand, I think, in a way that's happening in the US when you see the parents who are now rising up in arms, figuratively speaking, against school boards that are trying to ram CRT down the throats of the kids, right? Um, so I guess what I'm saying here is if, uh, that I really feel that there's a need for us to sit down and really grapple. Doug, the professor of religious studies from University um, uh, McGill University made this point months ago. We need a larger strategy. You have to approach this as we would a chess game with all kinds of moves, uh, short-term, long-term, medium-term, a coordinated larger strategy, which involves developing the right kind of rhetoric that we need to tackle this as a problem, not just only at the university level, but at the society le uh, level as a whole. And part of it is the kind of rhetoric that, we, we, that would be most effective for us to deploy. Uh, I thank you I very much. Thank, long, thank you very much for it. I, I, I sorry to interrupt, but I just wonder maybe that uh, Francis and Mark could uh, could uh, respond to your question, and we'll move on to the next one if that's okay. Francis, go ahead. Uh, well, I think there's a couple of things that come to mind. I think that's true, but that that sort of makes it too large to kind of deal with. Like I do agree that we are seeing a shift. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I, I sound alarmist when I say it, but I really do think we are heading towards a totalitarian kind of situation. Like it just seems to me that freedom of speech is the first thing that goes in this kind of thing. And, and that requires like how to deal with that. I don't know. 
uh, lessons from history if there's been uh, abilities to kind of fight back against this. But from a more narrow perspective, one of the things which is very, which I had no idea about, and this is something I just found out about last year when I started getting subjected to all these star chamber processes, is the the procedure like these things are all done in secret these all these act all these processes and there we have to fight to get those to be brought out to become more public um i'm not sure exactly how to do that but uh, in my case it was fighting a lot and still fighting to get the um like sort of the judicial principles to be respected uh, and that's only going to happen when you go to arbitration but what the university does is it just it tries to get you under the light bulb and to confess your crimes. Like that's really, I was just, and I fought and fought and fought trying to get them to, you know, provide documents so that I would know how, what kind of structure we would be operating. And they would, they would just basically refuse to do it. So um, hopefully like that's one of, that's a very, very minor point in a larger, but if we could get uh, these these kind of, and harassment is the one that I'm familiar with. That is just terrible. The harassment kind of processes that go on because they're, they're not very well defined. So it's kind of a subjective thing. And then you don't have the proper procedures in place to make sure that you can, um, you know, that there's gonna be a standard that's gonna be uh, like a bar that's gonna be met, that that's not there at all. So you can do the most innocuous thing that someone is upset about, especially if it's a member of an identity group that the university is trying to placate, uh, then you're in a very dangerous situation. But as far as I know, the courts haven't been completely compromised by reified postmodernism at this point. So if it goes to arbitration, maybe we can get the, the policies changed, but that's very you know superficial. But the wider one is, you know, First of all, you know, people have to realize this is this is we're heading down a road that is very very dangerous, and uh, everyone just goes, oh, it's a passing phase, that or something. That's not true. It's it's this is this is so that's kind of the wider uh, type of approach. Oh, in the interest of uh, uh, hearing from others, let's let, we can move on. Uh, I don't yeah, have that. Rhoda will, will be next if uh, she'd like to ask her question. Yeah, I have a short story from 1980 about <laughs> vacation. A friend of mine, I'll call her Mrs. Jones, was teaching grade one. A parent complained that she had used corporal punishment on another parent's child. The principal called the parents of the relevant child in and said, did this happen? And the parents said, no, Mrs. Jones did not hit, hit our child, but even if she did, we wouldn't mind because she taught our older child and she's a great teacher. The principal then called in the complainant and said, I have spoken to Mrs. Jones and dealt with it. Mrs. Jones quit teaching. So this has been going on for a very long time. It is not only a consequence of postmodernism, but I have a question specifically for Mark. Uh, Mark, I don't know if I took down your sort of rule correctly, but you had some kind of rule you proposed about bringing an end to to behaviors when when the the continued violation of of caused by this behavior threatens the teaching and research um, mission of the university. Teaching or research. Teaching or research. Yeah, I think that that rule would just work in the favor of universities. They would say that by um, so-called allegedly disrespecting a student or not taking their opinion seriously or so on and so, so forth, you were in fact violating the, uh, the teaching mission of the university. Yes, so I don't think it would work. Uh, okay, I... I uh... I, I, I accept that. Um, <laughs> uh, is it to it work? Worked. I mean, I, I it just uh, the, the, um, the 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 idea is that uh, at a university where people are committed to the um, um, the attempt to understand things, 
and the uh, the processes of, um, uh, of of argument and investigation by which we uh, we think we can do that uh, at that institution. Um, discipline would be undertaken only for, uh, as I said, uh, repeated violations of a, uh, of a regulation. Um, can, uh, you know, this maybe comes back to Boris's problem. How can we find administrators who have commitments to the academic mission and the academic values that support that mission? Um, so yes, I, I, I accept the, uh, the observation. It's a friendly observation. Mark. No, I, I, but I think, I think you're right. It, it all depends on the people and their commitments and how do we create uh, institutions that, um, uh, where the people who have these commitments um, aren't frustrated in their uh, attempt to live through them and where others um, are through their example invited into uh, these 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 ways of um, of investigating the world and, and thinking about things. Uh, so I think that's the uh, uh, the issue, the problem that your observation uh, raises. And if I could just respond too, it's something just came to me uh, when Rhoda was speaking. Um, it it could be there could be a problem, and this also ties into some of Boris's uh, kind of concerns. It could be that the that the structure, it's the whole structure of the university that is now a problem, which is, um, you know, the professional administrator. Um, there have been times where you've had administrators go and they spend four years, they're a faculty member, and then they just go and administer. And once they're done their two years or four years, they go back to their faculty position. That would be a much better way to achieve collegiality than these, you know, professional administrators uh, who just like put on a suit and see themselves as, you know, managing the university. So that that might be something as well uh, to, to change things, uh, to be more collegial. Robert? Hey, thank you very much. Uh, the next question will come from Kathleen Lowry. Um, so Mark, I know I've, I've raised this point to you just when you sent me a, a version of one of these papers, but I, unless I'm misunderstanding your argument, I, I'm not, I don't have a lot of confidence in this idea that you have that most, most, most things should be handled informally. So like people think you're being uncool and your colleagues should go and say like, hey, you're being, everyone thinks you're being kind of uncool. Could you stop? Because you're not doing you know, if it's if it's you're turning up for class and you're getting your papers, you're doing all the stuff that's contractually obligatory. But let's say you're like Francis or you're like me, and people just think you're not very cool, and so they come and they say, "Hey, you're not cool. Could you try to be cool?" I I actually think that would be worse. You know, <laughs> I I know in my case at least, a lot of what got me in trouble were student complaints that they refused to make formally because the administrators tried to say, hey, could you, so like tell us exactly how she turned you into a newt. And then they didn't want to, you know, I hadn't turned anybody into a newt, so they didn't want to make a formal complaint. They wanted to make a series of informal complaints that they wanted administrators to go. And actually the university's official position is still not that I was dismissed because I'm a radical feminist, I was dismissed because they can dismiss me for whatever reason they want and they don't have to explain why they dismissed me and yeah. students don't have to say what I like how what I the actual bad things I did because they didn't they couldn't say there was nothing bad that I had done that would actually tick any formal boxes really what I had done was I expressed views that they didn't agree with mm -hmm. so I, I actually think informal sanctions I mean based on my own experience I feel like we should be insisting on formal processes yeah. that if, if you want to get me in trouble you have to say what I did wrong. <laughs> and then you have to hear, have a hearing yeah. about what I did wrong. And then there has to be kind of, you know, some body of people, because the, the thing, I don't know, it's like, why do we have trial by jury? Because back in the day when it was like, well, everybody thinks you're not cool and the king agrees that you're not cool. So we're cutting off your head. I, I don't think, I don't think we want that. I don't think that's, so I think maybe I'm not, understanding your point quite, but I actually think formality helps us. The people, so this follow-up to that would be, 
the thing that formality really doesn't or the people that it doesn't help are untenured faculty, which are now the majority of faculty, which I think is another reason the situation has gotten so bad is I would say my tenured colleagues have been incredibly cowardly and I'm mad at them, but I think untenured people are cowardly and they're right to be cowardly because not, and, and that's who the majority of our colleagues are now. Like I, I do know at least one um, adjunct faculty who feels as I do, and she wouldn't say that in front of students for all the tea in China, and she's right. I mean, she, that she'd never get hired anywhere and she's on the job market. So I don't, I don't, and I don't know what the answer is, or I mean, one answer would be we, we restructure the university so we stop relying so much on people who don't have the kind of protections that make speaking up yeah. possible. But I, I think an informal system would be just disastrous for people without tenure because then it wouldn't even be a conversation of like everybody thinks you're uncool could you be cool it would be oh you know what we just don't have like we don't need you to teach 101 ever again and we don't have to explain why yeah. so so insisting on formality i think for both tenured people and untenured people and and everybody, rather than these kind of mobs that then everyone freaks out and is like, ah, oh, I get rid of the person being mobbed because they're stinky. Um, if you say, no, 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 you have to have a process, you have to have deliberation, nothing can happen until the whole deliberation has been gone through. And then by the time the whole deliberation has gone through, probably it's a year later and nobody even remember. I mean, for most of these things, it's, it's, a, it's a feeding frenzy that lasts like two weeks and people's mm -hmm. lives get destroyed. So I, I would I I would be an advocate of formality, not informality. That's but thank you for both of your talks. Right. Uh, very good, Kathleen. And I have uh, I've taken your uh, your comments into uh, in, into uh, consideration in my <laughs> my revisions. And uh, um, you said informal sanctions. There are no informal sanctions. If it's informal, there are no sanctions. Um, uh, the uh, the kids don't think you're cool. Uh, too bad, says the professor, and that's that. Um, what I mean by, um, but, but you know, I, another point uh, that, that you make um, uh, following um, uh, Laura Nader was um, uh, you're fooling yourself if you think that the, um, if the, if you think the system is informal, it, it, it's, it's a formal system just pretending to be uh, an informal system. Um, if the dean's coming to talk to you about something, get the union representative there right away, right? You know, make it a, 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 a thing on the record. Now, um, and maybe that's, maybe that's right. Maybe this again is the real world um, intruding uh, upon my, uh, my, uh, my, my lovely thought construction. But the idea is if there's, if, if, if something is rubbing the students the wrong way about um, your teaching, your classroom um, uh, uh, mannerisms, uh, the uh, decor in your office or whatever. Um, and uh, I mean, really the students should be talking to you. You know, Mark, I don't like what you have on, <laughs> on, on, on your wall. Um, now there was, uh, I forget the, uh, there's Regina, University of Regina a few years back where there was um, uh, office decor was, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the complaints. Uh, why not talk? Why not students talk to the professor first about these things? Um, and why not colleagues, chair, uh, dean, uh, uh, talk to them about these things? Now I'm also um, um, uh, assuming, and perhaps naively, uh, that there's really very little of this. Um, rubbing people the wrong way going on. It, it goes on, but um, you know, we, can, we can tolerate a, a, a fair bit of it. Uh, and um, if, if we have uh, uh, people of goodwill, um, then you know, informal systems, well, no, just informality, uh, maybe not even a system. Um, uh, you know, in, 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 in my case and other cases that I've, that I've heard of, uh, had a dean or a vice president just called the guy up on the phone and said something, um, then that might have saved a lot of, uh, 
a lot of hassle. But again, it is the dean uh, or the vice president calling them up, and it might be um, just a mistake to think that uh, uh, people with uh, with authority and titles uh, can um, uh, interact informally uh, with uh, with people whose behavior is uh, is off putting in 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 one way or another. Um, yeah, so no, I, I, I take the, um, so the, um, uh, your idea then is that uh, there's nothing that um, allege, make the allegation, um, make it uh, uh, formal, and then have a, um, um, a fair system marked by natural justice in place in order to, uh, in order to take care of it. Um, I think you know that would be abandoning uh, the idea of the institution as a collegial place, but uh, maybe that's uh, uh, the price that would have that we'd have to pay uh, in order to keep going. What uh, you know, uh, what, what what we think best. So I um, I suspect you're right. I hope you're wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, question will be from Frank. Yes, this is my first time joining this uh, um, club, so uh, maybe a very brief, a very brief uh, reason why I'm here. There's nothing what I've heard so far, and I assume some people have experienced even worse than what I've heard, but I've run into the second encounter with this university, and um, I've read a bit about it. Um, I, I'm not yet any, anywhere close to disciplinary actions, I think, but that might be the next step, who knows. Um, but what they do is I've read a couple of relevant policies, not too many actually. Um, and what they do is they never define the terms. And they do this on purpose so that they can stretch it any way they want. Because how can you be against equity, diversity and inclusion? If you just look at those words, it's, it's not much you can say, I don't, I, I'm against them. But you have to see how they implement them and you have to look one layer deeper what they want to achieve. So five years ago, I saw the rot um, ha happening in what I call across campus. I'm actually in chemistry, but by training an engineer. So I know a little bit more about science and engineering here. But I really saw that the rot was, was what I call across campus. Maybe not in the fine arts, but in the humanities and the social sciences. Five years ago, I thought, okay, probably because we are scientists, we get away with it. Well, no, the rot, the rot has arrived. And, and it, the rot is so deep that I think we have to go outside the academia. We have to tell the general public what's going on. They have to say to their children, you're not going to go to that university. Now, I know that this is a dangerous strategy, but eventually the students will decide whether we, we survive as a university or not. So I think the rot is so deep but I think that this is not done locally anymore. And, and I was in, in a way a little bit um, more positive now that because of the COVID, the schools in the US were closed and now the, now the parents know what was being taught to their children. So they have waken up, right? So we have to waken up the general public about how the rot is. Um, and the fact that we have professional administrators is, is the second reason, the same reason why the, Roman, the Western Roman Empire, after Caesar was killed, actually disappeared because they came detached from reality. That's what, what very often with elitist people uh, happen, and they are only interested in power. So I, I like to leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, well, one of the great things that's happening is the people in the sciences are starting to see it like like the arts got hit like it's been going on for decades but it got really bad you know 2010 but Thomas Hudlicki who we had speak uh that was just shocking <laughs> I'm still shocked by his case uh, and that just shows you and also as well uh Dorian Abbott from University of Chicago um there is a this is on the move to mm -hmm. go after the sciences and fortunately, you know, people in the sciences have more, their, their methods are more uh, rigorous. So uh, they can fight back a bit better than, than the, the arts uh, faculties can. Uh, so that's one hopeful thing. Yeah, that's but 
Also. Yeah, I like I like to share an observation here. I, I think the scientists and the engineers are just naive because we are always late on the policy. The policy is already written. Mm. And then we start, then, then we hear about it. And then we start thinking about it. And by that time, the decision has been made. Mm. Because I, in that sense, I think the science the, scient the scientists and the engineers are, are, they are not political beasts, at least mm -hmm. most of them are not. And they are not these social activists. They just want to do their job and, and life will go on. So I think we're always late in the game. So I don't share your optimism completely, but I hope, I hope that you're right. Uh, well, it's definitely been in my own case, when I started to make connections with the people in the, in the science faculty, that's when things started to take on more of a, a serious uh, kind of uh, like a, a, the, the having a university wide kind of uh, pushback against mm -hmm. it. Not like we're still vast. <laughs> we're still vastly outnumbered. But if we could just get a few more people in the science faculty, not kind of pandering mm -hmm. to all this stuff, uh, that would be very, very helpful because it just is like, if you're in art and I'm in the faculty of arts at Mount Royal, um, you know, we have, you know, 44% of the faculty of arts is just completely totalitarian. Like they, mm -hmm. they voted against a motion in favor of open inquiry. Like <laughs> they don't want open inquiry. 44% <laughs> is like really bad. Uh, and the science, they just, they don't think it's coming for them maybe partly, but as well, they, they, it, it has a nice sound to it. So it's just, you know, let's get some, especially all this, this commentary about if you have underrepresentation, this somehow means that discrimination is occurring. Like this is kind of, it's like, no, this is a big misunderstanding of statistics and evidence and so on that uh, many people in the arts, because we're, we have such soft yeah, science. One so of the see. reasons I say that the rot is very deep is these people just don't believe in evidence because no. they, don't, they don't care. No. So you can't have a discussion with them. No. Because they would certainly say to me that I'm an, uh, an old, I don't think I'm old, but for them, I'm, I'm an old white supremacist. Yes, they would. Right? But the, yeah. The only thing and that the works other, with That's them. the other tactic they do is they, they yeah. try to label you to push you in the corner and you have to fight your way out of the corner. And by that time, that word has lost its meaning. They label you with another word. Or they have changed the meaning of a word that used to have a very well-defined meaning in the past. It's the same tactics overall, but the strategy is is control, power yes. and control. Yes, and George Orwell. You know, this is what George Orwell was talking about in you know, in 1984 and so on. Yeah. Um, the only thing that works with the uh, members of the reified postmodernist element is satire, mocking, mm -hmm. mocking them. That works because okay. then they don't know how to. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the that's one strategy which is has been very effective on on some levels. Uh, make it can bite you pretty bad too doing it, but still it has an effect which makes people a bit wary about continuously making yeah. these ridiculous arguments. But um, there there's a lot of like things are very difficult right now. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, the next question will be from uh, William Mc McNally. Uh, and then after that, it will be uh, from Victoria. And I don't have any other questions on the list. If I have missed you, uh, please send it again. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll be done after Victoria's question. But first, uh, William, if you wanted to go. Hey, uh, Francis, I just want to give you a heads up about this satirist on Twitter called Not Widowson. <laughs> she's savage and she's coming after you. So watch out. I know. I know. She's just, yeah. That's my, um, my satirical efforts. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a quick comment to Mark about the informal approach. I think that's gone out the window with the, with the Bradley, and, um, Bradley and Campbell uh, victimhood culture that we're living in that there's a preference with this generation to make the complaint to, to an authority. Um, I, I wanna start with a, a, um, an observation and then finish with a question and get you guys to comment on both. So the observation is uh, in, in, in Mark's process, they accused him of, uh, I don't know if I have the wording right, he didn't nurture a, a, a climate uh, or an environment of respect. 
Um, and and I'm seeing I'm seeing so I'm seeing universities writing checks that they can't cash about a safe and inclusive learning environment. Uh, or uh, here's here's one from Laurier. They say if students have experienced racism, hate, or oppression in the classroom, then there are avenues at Laurier uh, to complain, and they provide links. These are very subjective gray uh, categories that that um, are promises that the university is making about the learning environment uh, that create the grounds for a complaint if a student feels that the university or a faculty member didn't live up to that gray promise. So I, I wonder if that's part of the mushrooming. So that's number one. Number two, I'm wondering if this is a tactic. Um, are, are, are woke activists putting policies in place as tripwires to persecute and silence dissenting voices? So yes. that's it. Number yeah. one, uh, uh, well, you heard it, go. Well, uh, you're, you're right about, uh, about both. I think um, uh, just about number two, uh, the, um, the, the coming to campus in the, um, between 2000 and 2010, maybe a little after 2010, of the safe and respectful campus policies, uh, the expanded um, uh, harassment policies, the um, uh, student codes of conduct, even the uh, codes of conduct uh, for professors. All of these, uh, I mean, when I, when I read them, when I read them back then, I was complaining, I was saying, look, this thing can be abused very easily. Why? Because the term respect in them um, might be understood to be something like care and concern and solicitousness for feelings. Now we understand respect to mean um, care and concern for the intellectual and moral autonomy of people. That is, uh, we respect people by not manipulating them. Uh, on the other hand, um, respect in the sense of solicitude for feelings means manipulate people <laughs> right? into um, uh, uh, um, uh, a sense of um, um, assurance of their identity or, 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 or whatever. So don't say, uh, don't be candid, don't, be, don't say what's on your mind. Uh, you respect people uh, by um, um, looking after their feelings and their, and, and their identity. So I, I, I made this complaint very well, made this observation about these policies very early on uh, when they started uh, coming in at, at St. Mary's. Um, and the few um, administrators who, uh, I send my stuff to everybody, to all the administrators, but the very few who responded said, don't worry, Mark, we won't. <laughs> well, indeed it was the safe and respectful campus policy under which I was uh, um, uh, uh, hauled on to, onto the carpet. And, and again, the, the, the irony was there. Um, uh, basically, um, I failed to show respect to an unnamed complainant by not exempting her from the message that I sent to <laughs> the, the, the other administrators. Uh, and, and for me uh, to have said, oh, wait a second, her receiving this message might, uh, uh, might upset her. And again, I didn't think what one way, uh, but if I had thought that to myself, then I would have, I said, oh, wait a second, not to send it to her would be to treat her with respect, <laughs> uh, with disrespect. Uh, this, this would be uh, manipulative. This would be, so um, it, it is indeed these policies. I thought at first um, that these policies um, uh, were merely poorly written and um, um, were open to misinterpretation. I'm now starting to think that indeed the goal was uh, to uh, to change uh, the uh, the meanings of things like uh, uh, like respect. Uh, no, what was the first point again? Uh, oh yes, yes, um, uh, about uh, students and their expectations. Uh, well, I I think I sent you an article of mine um, that I I wrote um, addressed to the students in my class, explaining. Oh explaining, um, it, it appeared in Minding the Campus uh, uh, a month or two months ago. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to uh, um, link to it uh, when, I, uh, when I'm back in the classroom in September. Uh, but basically it explains what we are trying to do uh, when we gather together in the classroom in our courses um, and um, what, um, why complaining about uh, what people say 
in 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 the court in the classroom, um, uh, complaining about um, you know even their tone, but certainly about the um, uh, the content of of what they say uh, is um, anti-academic, is um, um, not consistent with uh, with academic values or with the the mission uh, the mission in our, our classroom. What are we doing in the classroom? I mean, I tell my I tell the students. Um, I'm not teaching you anything. You're not here to learn anything. If you get, if I teach, that's just by accident. If you learn, it's just by accident. What we are here to do is to grapple with the matter at hand, to try to understand uh, what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about something. And now here is how it goes best. And it goes best if we don't um, complain to authorities about the content of each other's ideas, the ideas that each other floats, uh, maybe we're not um, uh, speaking in our own voice, uh, or even uh, uh, about the, uh, the tone or the, uh, uh, the words uh, used. So I'm trying um, to model for my students what, academic, what the academic engagement looks like, uh, how to participate in the academic engagement. And I'm um, laying out um, as explicitly as I can um, what I, you know, a, a description of this hoping that it has uh, some, uh, so, so, some influence. Uh, maybe it doesn't. Um, so anyway, that's a, um, um, an approach I'm trying to take with regard to students. Uh, first, uh, set an example, and then secondly, explain what the example is that you're setting. Thank you but very I'll send, much. I'll, yeah. I'll send you that paper. <laughs> Okay, so we'll move on to Victoria's question. And uh, as I said in the chat, this is the uh, um, this is the end of our, or will be the end, unless uh, Mark and Francis think think otherwise. The end of the question period. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, thanks. Um, I actually um, wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the focus so much in so many of these discussions in SAS is about individuals and their cases, and they're very, very interesting and compelling and important. But um, the thing that I find um, more disturbing to me right now is that, in fact, this is really not a student driven thing at all. And that more and more we're, and it's not about professional administrators, it's the fact that the administrators are actually now pushing very, very hard to develop all these kinds of policies, which takes these kind of what we call the woke student perspective. It's actually not from them, it's uh, from some faculty, it's from Many administrators, it's coming from governments, it's coming from federal governments. So people talk about indigenization, climate change, all these kinds of things that come to have very, very um, specific kinds of belief uh, structures around them. So one of the things I've been asking inside my university is you're pushing and pushing this EDI or DEI or whatever they call it, these EDI policies. And as you're pushing these EDI policies, you're being, we're being told that this is the virtuous thing to do and this is the right thing to do and that somehow um, we're, we're all meant to, some of us are just meant to shut up because we're just guilty and white. And I've been asking, am, am I allowed to, to actually criticize these policies? Are you trying to say, I'm gonna to have to sign on to these policies? And I think that um, the one most interesting thing is one my new um, president, a, a union president sent around a note talking about the fact that she's been involved in discussions of academic freedom. And I don't know if anybody here goes to CUFA, but apparently, or CAUT, at CAUT, they've been talking about um, some articles and um, things written by Michael Lift, I think his name is, um, about constitution, the constitution and what happens inside arbitrations around people being disciplined, not because of a student complaint, but because um, people speak out against these policies. And it can be any kind of policy, but you can imagine as these EDI policies uh, join some of the other um, progressive policies um, that uh, the university will say, well, we're trying to create this particular kind of, of, of milieu, this safe environment, the things we've been talking about in the chat. And that, you know, basically uh, we're not gonna wait for students to go after you uh, or do a private thing. We're, we're really, we're just going to come after you because somebody draws attention to the fact that you're saying the wrong things or you are questioning our policies, you're overly questioning our policies. And I'm just wondering how we can try to work that into the discussion a little bit, because I think when we focus on the on the in, on the student complaint, it doesn't get into the fact and people have raised it with the corporation and the idea of the university as a place that um, we work and the definition of us as workers who are meant to actually um, not uh, damage the uh, not damage the institution. 
And so I, I don't know what, it's, it's a big question, but it's just something that seems to me to be um, uh, this idea that we've, we've got to hang on to the, to the right to actually speak out against these policies as they get, and that's, I, people talk about postmodern reification. I, I don't think that's it. I think we're going to get a kind of um, a hardening of the, of the connection between the complaint process at the individu individual level and this much more um, uh, top-down, extremely top-down, initiated by administrators to discipline people who are speaking out against these policies. So this kind of group that we're having right now and the things we're discussing, um, just our membership in that committee, in, in, in this group and talking about the things we talk about or questioning some of the things we want to question would actually become a matter of undermining the university's values and goals and mission as they come to express them. So, it was just a sort of observation in a way to, to try to think about how it is we're supposed to deal with all this. So that's my thing. Yes, well, I think um, in terms of uh, what I saw at Mount Royal University, <clears throat> I remember uh, we had a co uh, discussions about the code of conduct. So we had a code of conduct that was proposed and it, it, was, it was originally brought in because it was a conflict of interest kind of like that was supposed to be about declaring conflict of interest but what happened is that it got taken over by the uh, administration as a handy uh, weapon uh, to and they had wording in it originally that was that you couldn't undermine the reputation of the university or something like that some really frightening language and, and that got a fire under many people's uh, behinds. And we did get that taken out of the, uh, of the code of conduct. It's still a huge, hugely problematic. And that's one of the things that I am currently battling because they managed to take a few, you know, there's a few kind of innocuous clauses about, you know, respect. Again, it's this, this kind of wording that sounds, sounds okay but then gets uh, kind of mobilized against people who are slightly controversial in their, the way they go about things. Because, and now with the EDI stuff, it is disrespect is when people's identities are not being uh, valued. So, uh, and indigenization is the one that I've run afoul of now, <clears throat> which is again, um, they have in their language, like, uh, you must value or everyone, the university values indigenous ways of knowing and these kinds of things. And, and I've said, I, and I, again, I was raising the alarm, you know, five years ago about this language that this would be used against people who were critical of whatever this would be. And they said, no, 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 this won't have that effect uh, because you have academic freedom and everyone realizes that you have academic freedom and you will be protected by the collective agreement uh, uh, to be able to do that. But that doesn't stop those policies from being deployed. Uh, those policies- it's not, just, it's not just that, it's that um, Michael Link's article points out that many arbitrators, when they talk about this, somebody will say, we've got this language in our collective agreement, but, but arbitrators tend to go with normal labor labor relations law where in which the the employer gets to kind of have various rules about conduct that are quite different from a university and they don't tend to because we don't have academic freedom uh, guaranteed anywhere except perhaps inside our collective agreements and the collective agreements um, are sometimes put in opposition to other kinds of labor law practices and, and, and policies. I, I'm not a lawyer so I don't know enough about that but it does yeah. seem to me that... Um, well there's not very few unfortunately there's very few cases that go to arbitration because they're pleaded out early. So what'll happen is the union will encourage you to, if you're gonna be suspended for two weeks without pay, they'll try and plead it out. So you'll just get a letter of reprimand and you'll get your payback. Or if you're suspended for four months, they'll say, well, how about a one month about without pay? So that's kind of how it's all done. And the union is eager for you to do that because then the expense of arbitration is not going to be. So there's not very many cases about it. and. Uh, we're going to see it, it's kind of alarming that so much is riding on you know what an arbiter is going to decide uh, when there's not very much kind of legal guidance about it um, but with respect to the code of conduct um, 
that they are, uh, what happens is they use the policy, they don't care whether the policies violate all sorts of principles. They, they just go ahead and do it. And most people that freaks them out uh, a lot to have that happen. But even if you're prepared to go through it, which I am, I will go through the whole thing and see what happens because I want to fight it out. Um, still, you're dependent upon all the arguments being made after the fact, which may, may or may not be successful. It, it's a big, huge gamble. Uh, and that's kind of the alarming thing. So it really has to be tackled much earlier on in terms of these policies. Like the, and, and, and I don't know how to, like it's just a mess because everyone's kind of bought into the, or a large number of people have that, you know, we really want our employer, you know, kind of managing our behavior all the time. Like it's, I guess it's this victimhood culture or what, whatever, or, you know, like coddling, all, all these kinds of books, Jonathan Haidt and everything about coddling. And there's, there's a lot of stuff about how we, we don't really take responsibility anymore for our own lives. We, we want to have, you know, big brother coming in and, you know, looking after us, you know, it's like, oh, this is not going to be a good outcome, but uh, we sort of, there's a lot of people who are making these arguments uh, that I see and it's, it's, it's very frightening. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Robert, I think we could take one more question if there, if there is one, uh, we're over time now, but. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there was problem. one. There's a lot of people in the chat saying things, but uh, I don't think there was any other questions okay. that came in. That's, well, I'll just add something to uh, uh, what uh, Francis was uh, saying in response to Victoria. So I think Victoria is right, and I think this is very worrisome. Uh, the, um, uh, we, we all probably remember that Universities Canada um, a decade ago, maybe even more, um, when it uh, uh, came out with its um, uh, uh, account of academic freedom dropped uh, extramural utterance as, uh, as, as protected. Um, and so, um, speaking publicly critically about one's university is something that uh, Universities Canada does not want protected. Universities Canada is the uh, organization to which all um, uh, presidents of uh, universities in, in, in Canada, uh, accredited universities in Canada uh, belong. Um, that created um, a, a bit of a furor and even uh, the CAUT was um, um, upset by that. But well, 10 years, 12 years, however long, uh, have have passed and um, uh, extramural utterance as protected by academic freedom not so clear anymore. Especially when um, many people who are writing about academic freedom in, uh, say, um, university affairs or uh, the uh, higher education, um, uh, the, the the British um, uh, uh, Journal, are now talking about academic freedom as the freedom to pursue one's um, particular specialty. Uh, and so, so I think these, these forces are, um, are, are coming together and um, criticism of the university as, a, um, as something protected by academic freedom uh, may very well not survive much longer. Uh, Victoria is right that uh, the collective agreement is only as good as the arbitrator's um, interpretations of it or commitments uh, 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 to it and commitments to other aspects of labor law can get in the way. It's the collective agreements are only as good as the union's uh, commitments to them. Um, how to um, change the climate uh, so that um, academic freedom and robust academic freedom is protected is, the, uh, is, is a serious practical problem for us. Uh, taking it out of the university, I think there are two things uh, we can say. I mean, I love to talk about um, engaging the matter at hand for the sake of engaging the matter at hand, but that appeals only to us. That appeals only <laughs> to the people on the inside of the institution. What is it about universities universities as places where uh, people who value moral and intellectual autonomy get together in order to gra grapple with, the, uh, with matters at hand. Uh, what is it that uh, makes these institutions uh, worth the support of people outside them who don't care to do that? Well, I think there are two things. One, 
teaching, uh, people outside the university hope that um, the young people who graduate from our institutions are able to think and value for themselves. Uh, if uh, that's not happening, people will be, uh, will be upset. The other thing is that they want uh, research that is trustworthy. Maybe not research, they want research that's accurate, uh, but at least they want it to be trustworthy. And you can't trust research that you believe must come to some particular conclusion and can't come to some other conclusion. So I think this is why um, uh, many people are skeptical about what uh, university uh, uh, research says about one topic or another, uh, because they uh, believe, and perhaps rightly, that the uh, researchers uh, fear for their, uh, their reputations, their friendships, and everything else, unless they come to uh, the, right, uh, the right conclusion. So if we, uh, perhaps if we make those two points, uh, that a university marked by robust academic freedom will do a good job at, um, um, at uh, uh, graduating young people who can think for themselves and will do a good job at generating trustworthy research, uh, we can uh, uh, sway uh, the, 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 the public to take a harder look at universities and uh, try to uh, make them uh, more um, academically uh, uh, rigorous. I think that's a very good point, Mark. Uh, I think that is is often lost. Is you know we we need to you know encourage people to think about the university, the, the benefits of having an actually sound academically sound university, not just an egghead kind of thing. It's got real life implications, and the people that are now taking over uh, a great deal of the university, they they are going to have a terrible effect on what is actually how students are thinking and and the kind of uh you know research that's produced one final thing that i wanted to mention which i think has been touched upon but is a very serious problem in the whole picture is the and kirsten i noticed kirsten had a had a comment in the chat about this is the unions the unions and 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 at mount royal we used to have a very very good union um, it was very dependable and uh, you could be relied upon and people took it for granted. And uh, it's been taken over by uh, reified postmodernists. We still have a, a couple of really good people on there and I'm hoping that we can maybe, you know, get it back on track. But that is the most frightening thing of all because we are so dependent on our faculty associations defending uh, our academic freedom and if they don't really think you should have academic freedom because the things that you say are, you know, harassing or hate speech or all these kinds of things, which are, um, which like this this language is 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 was never all that common, uh, but now it's you hear it all over the place. Um, it's it's going to just create it's just going to be a shambles because no one is going to have the confidence to fight back against it because they won't be defend they can't rely on their faculty associations so that's the other thing to keep an eye on and and to try to become as involved as you can one of the problems with the um, you know the open inquiry you know academic freedom kind of coalition is that it tends to have an individualistic streak that is quite resistant to the idea of faculty associations but the way it's set up is that um, you know, it's very important who your faculty association representatives are. And uh, we tried a couple of years ago to, to run a slate of candidates who were supportive of academic freedom. We were unsuccessful. Um, it was very depressing. Uh, but still, we could, you know, we should, I, I'm still very, very committed to trying to constantly challenge, at least, you know, run for a few positions and actually put out campaign statements to let people know that you know, there are supporters of open inquiry and academic freedom on campus. So that's another thing to keep your eye on in terms of, you know, ensuring that the university is an academic space as opposed to this politicized kind of environment. Well, thank, thank you, every, uh, thank you everyone very much uh, for, uh, for coming uh, tonight. It was a really good discussion.